Obviously, you'll know the panel, but I will do brief introductions just in case. Um, to my left is Yvette Cooper, Labour MP, um, and to my far right, I probably shouldn't say left and far right, should I? But uh, over there is Anand Menon, who's the Director of UK in a Changing Europe, who are, of course, our hosts our hosts this evening, and Tracy Braben, who's still relatively new Mayor of West Yorkshire. Um, so we be interested to hear how, um, you know, how, how she's getting on in that role. Um, and um, the plan, the format basically is, I'm, I'll sort of kick off the discussion with the panellists, and then we're quite keen to come to you for questions and get you involved um, as soon as we can. So um, I'll, I'll start by, I'll start with the vet, if that's all right, and I'd just like to know whether you think the problem with the question that we've all been posed is in fact that the red wall isn't just one place. Um, it's clearly not. The, I think the constituencies that we lost in 2019, some of them for the first time, actually were heavily towns. And so sometimes people talk about as if this was a northern and a midlands thing, but actually the constituencies, a lot of the constituencies we're talking about are towns. And we're just looking at um, some of the figures that of the 59, 60 or so seats that swung from Labour to the Conservatives, only one was in a core city, six were in other cities, smaller cities, 40 were in towns, nine were in villages. Mm -hmm. And most strikingly, of city seats, we now hold around 75% of city constituencies, but of town constituencies, we hold just around 30%. And I think that, you know, we can talk about the different uh, things that happened in the 2019 election, the issues around the way our leadership was seen, the issues around the, uh, the Brexit and, and what happened there, but we also shouldn't underestimate actually the significance of Labour being, I think, was seen too much as a city's party rather than actually being a party that for towns across the country. And I think that is one of the most important things that we have to do in terms of uh, rebuilding in areas that we lost and earning back votes, not taking them for granted, earning back actually in street by street, uh, community by community, building back that trust. Um, uh Tracy, um, obviously you, re you represent um, West Yorkshire, but there are quite geographical differences between all the different areas which are lumped in together as the Red Wall, aren't there? And isn't that part of the problem that, you know, what the North East has with some parts of the Midlands, for example, are, are quite different? Mm. I think uh, it's just quite interesting. I've just done a, um, an event on the main stage with um, Andy Burnham and Dan Jarvis talking about this very thing. And when, when colleagues from Westminster say, you know, how are we going to win back those red wall seats? How are we going to get back into power? When it just feels so strange because actually as the mayor of West Yorkshire, I am in power. Andy is in power. Dan Jarvis is in power. Sadiq Khan is in power. And if you think that across the north, three out of five citizens are represented by a mayor, we are in a position where we can absolutely deliver for the Labour Party those Labour values that have drilled down into, certainly for me, 10 manifesto pledges that were about bringing buses back into public control, about 5,000 affordable homes, 1,000 jobs for young people. The clarity of this offer, and it's all a Labour offer, really was compelling for people who potentially may not have voted or potentially would not have thought about voting in a general election, but they wanted somebody who was their champion, somebody from the region, born and raised. I'm a proud Yorkshire woman. Uh, you know, I could go on about how brilliant Yorkshire is for all night, um, but I think it, they are looking for champions, and I think um, we can help Labour win back those red wall seats. Um, and um, I've just lost the mic there, so I'll just keep projecting. And if, oh, here we go. Um, but Andy made a pledge, actually, from the stage, and he said, conference, next year we will have won back all those red wall seats because as mayors we will have made that happen. I mean, it's quite a big pledge, but I think um, it's, it's quite exciting for us to be able to help and work with um, uh, MPs that could potentially be under siege from the Tories to help them deliver on their pledges locally. Because we know that Boris Johnson does this across the country. He supports to, uh, Conservative MPs and says, you know, what they're delivering 
if you want a better town, a better city, vote Conservative. Well, I'm in a unique position in the same way Andy and Dan, etc. are. I can deliver for Labour colleagues in my region as well, working together and, you know, understanding what they need in order to get over the line. But, you know, it's not going to be easy. I'm not taking anything for granted at all. And we desperately, desperately need a Labour government. We've only just seen, haven't we, the universal credit hike, the um, uh, reduction, rather, £1,000 pounds uh, for the people of West Yorkshire on UC, rising um, fuel costs, the queues at the petrol stations. I mean, it could not be more urgent. And I think it is quite an exciting opportunity working with mayors and MPs to get those red wall seats back. Um, and Anand, if I had to mention Brexit, and obviously we don't want to rehearse all the arguments as to why, why that happened, else we'd, we'd be here not just the next hour, but uh, probably the rest of the conference. Um, but it is the case that Brexit was... Um, regarded as one of the key reasons why so many of the seats in so-called Red Wall fell. I'd just be interested to know, looking forward rather than backwards, whether you think that will continue to be an issue and how important Labour has to um, regard the issue of Brexit going into the next election in order to win back some of those seats. Uh, I suppose the answer to that is yes and no. I mean, firstly, Brexit is part of a divide over values. And my colleague Paula Surridge, who should be in this room somewhere, if you read her work on cross-pressured voters, what, she'll, what, what her work shows very clearly is the kind of voters who switch, the kind of voters who lean towards the left on the economy, but towards the right on values. And one of the going forward, I think, one of the really interesting and important questions is going to be you know, fuel shortages, possible food shortages, possible rising inflation, and we don't know what happens with unemployment at the end of the furlough scheme. If the economy becomes the key issue again, this becomes a very different battleground than if values is, is uh, what matters. Second thing I would say is we should avoid the sort of lazy stereotypes of the northern voter that we hear so often. You often hear, oh, you know, Labour's got real problems if they want to do a Green New Deal because no one in the north believes in the climate crisis. It's nonsense. All the polling shows that basically there has been, there is virtually as much concern in these northern seats about things like the climate crisis as there is in southern seats. So a lot of the message we heard today from Rachel is going to resonate. So we shouldn't just fall for, for, for stereotypes, but we should be aware of the fact that actually banging away on the economy is going to be every bit as crucial as well. Um, Yvette, you mentioned leadership earlier, and um, Tracy touched on the importance of local leadership. Now, of course, that applies with the Labour mayors, but it also applies in somewhere like Teesside with Ben Hyshen, who has um, been sort of like certainly a, a very high profile local mayor in the area um, and caused problems for the Labour Party as a result. Um, how does that interplay between national and, lead and local leadership work, and how much will it matter to have the support of the National Party? What can the National Party do, national leader? do to, um, to sort of help local leaders get the most out of what, you know, what, they, can, what they can deliver at the election? So I think one of the things that the, the Tories managed uh, to do or worked hard to try and do was effectively to, um, in a lot of our um, uh, areas which have long voted Labour, to blame Labour councils for national Tory austerity. And therefore, for the communities that often ended up being hardest hit by the scale of government cuts um, and the scale of local government cuts were often those areas with Labour councils. It was also areas where, again, coming back to my town's theme, I'd often seen the um, private sector pull out. So we'd lost banks from our high streets. A lot of more of the private sector investment was going into cities and not into towns. And what I think Boris Johnson managed to do or tried to do was to set out a, uh, what he would put as an optimistic vision for, uh, for towns. And he offered change. He managed to spin a whole series of false promises, um, but it was optimistic. And the thing that's been important for us in West Yorkshire and the thing that Tracy has managed to do fantastically is to be optimistic and to have an optimistic vision for West Yorkshire that is proud of West Yorkshire, that is proud of all of our communities, our towns and cities in West Yorkshire and have that optimistic vision for the future.
future, but we also have to make sure it is clear where blame lies for the damage that was done and challenge this idea that somehow Labour governments don't make a difference, that Labour councils don't make a difference, that Labour mayors don't make a difference. You know, when you think of the hundreds, such hundreds of short starts that closed right across the country that were open under a Labour government, the support that was provided across all of our towns by a Labour government, or the fact that actually under a Labour government, do you know what, you could see a GP within two days, you were guaranteed an appointment in two days, and how many people are tearing their hair out now trying to get a GP appointment and that is a consequence of long-term underinvestment and support for GPs and for that side of our NHS. So I think being proud of what Labour governments did do and delivered but also that partnership between the national and the local with the mayors playing a pivotal role is crucial. And I would just say as well to just follow on from, um, from what Anon said is that this issue about the cost of living crisis, do you know what, we should be talking about nothing else but yes. the cost of living crisis, the mm. Tories' cost of living crisis. It is just going to hit so many people, so many families across the country when you've got uh, something that the Tories made and the Tories do not get. You know, it's their fault that we don't have enough HGV drivers. This was predictable, and that is pushing prices up. You've seen the nature of the Brexit deal that Boris Johnson did. He didn't have to do it that way. There were many of other ways he could have done it that have ended up pushing up the bureaucracy and the costs for trade. You've seen the fact of them coming in with a national insurance contribution increase on low-paid workers, and then the universal credit cut this means, you know, you're talking about families across actually many of those constituencies that went Conservative for the first time, where around 10,000 or more families are going to be hit, and they are going to be losing, when you add up the double, triple, quadruple whammy, they are going to be losing £1,600 a year. Well, of course the Tories don't get it, because that is how much Boris Johnson pays on two rolls of wallpaper. They do not get it, but Labour does, and we should be shouting about the Tory cost of living crisis and our alternative plan. That should be every day throughout this conference. Every bit of social media that the Labour Party does should all be about the Tories' cost of living crisis and how we're going to challenge that and stand up for people, not just across the Red Wall, but everywhere else in the country who are being heavily and unfairly hit. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the, the green agenda because actually I think if you bring it to a local experience, then you can bring people with you. That, that stereotype that the northerners aren't interested in green. Well, one in 20 deaths in West Yorkshire are associated with poor air quality. If you start talking about that, how are we going to make sure that our air is better for our kids? Or, for example, I'm leading the charge on bus ref, uh, reform. And if you say your bus ticket is going to be cheaper, the, the, uh, the routes are going to be where you want to go, uh, they're going to be cleaner buses, they're going to be electric, you can plug in your mobile phone, you can get Wi-Fi. These are the arguments we should be making, not talking in sort of high-level terms about just how is this going to change your life? And, you know, it's also about jobs and skills, jobs for your young people. That's why I've set up a skills task force for the, for the green sector, because we know those jobs are there to make those young people have highly skilled opportunities as well. We don't want to make the same mistakes we did after the last crash and the financial crash where we made jobs but our productivity was low. The jobs were there but they were poor jobs, really poor salaries and poor um, uh, opportunities for self-progression. We have to say under our watch, those jobs and that when we're rebuilding out this crisis a fair, just and lasting recovery from COVID, those jobs are going to be good and they're going to make sure that our young people stay in our region and, you know, they can live where their families live, where their friends live. They don't have to move their, their home in order to fulfil their potential. So I do think it is how we frame it and the language we use rather than thinking, well, people wouldn't be interested in the green agenda because it feels like they have to pay more. It's about, you know, having that vision. Um, Anna, do you... Yeah, I just want to add a couple of things. I mean, firstly, on, on what Tracy just said, neither party has yet effectively linked the green agenda with levelling up. 
And I think it's an absolutely fundamental link. So you don't make you don't make tackling the climate crisis look like something that's being done to you. You make it look like something that's being done for you, because it is part of a broader agenda of making the economy fair. And there's a bit of a space there, I think, for Labour. But secondly, on what events, I think Yvette was absolutely right that Labour needs to be banging on about the cost of living crisis. The slight sense I get about the leadership at the moment is they're too slow with their messaging. So, if you take Brexit. You can be for Brexit or anti-Brexit, but you didn't have to be a trade economist to look at the trade and cooperation agreement and realise that there will be economic trouble to come because of it, because of the, what it did to our trade links with the European Union. I think Labour should have been saying that then, because then you could turn around and say, we've been telling you this for the best part of the year, and it's come to pass. If you think back to Cameron and Osborne, one of the things they did very well was they, they rolled out that phrase, fixing the roof when the sun is shining very early on, and they hammered and hammered away at it. And throughout the financial crisis, it served them very, very well indeed. I think Labour needs to be talking about the cost of living crisis before the universal credit uplift ends, before the cost of living crisis is being held in, felt in people's pockets, because then Labour can turn back and say, well, look, it's not, this isn't something out of the blue. We have been warning you for weeks, if not months. So I think getting ahead of the story is quite important here. Um, can I ask you about patriotism? Because... Um the Tories sort of wrapped themselves in the flag when it came to how they campaigned in some of the sort of seats that we're talking about. I just wondered whether how you, how important you feel that is for, for Labour and what and how Labour could challenge it, and also whether Labour needs a different different definition of patriotism. Because I always feel slightly that there's a danger that you start to get into sort of the whole sort of culture wars territory, and it becomes divisive rather than unifying. Yvette. Um, I don't think we need another definition. I think we should just be proudly, proudly patriotic. I think we should be you know, proud of um, the country that we are. Um, for me, that's being proud of Britain, proud of the UK, but also actually um, proud of being English, even though I was born in Scotland. I think of myself as proudly English as well. And, uh, and I think the, um, that sense of pride is a good thing. You can be proud and optimistic, and you can still also want things to change. You can want us to be a better country. You can want us to be a fairer country. You can want to challenge inequality and injustice and also be, be proud and confident of who we are. And I think it is true that at the, um, uh, at the last election, we were not seen as being um, uh, proud of, of who we were and or our leadership um, wasn't. And also um, determined to sort of stand up for issues around um, national security as well. I think you always have to take those kinds of things seriously. And I think it is um, possible to be very radical about the inequalities and the injustices that we want to challenge and also be very strong on supporting communities and supporting our national security as well. Um, and Tracy, do you think that um, Labour, Labour could be accused of complacency, um, taking for granted the support in some of the seats it lost? Oh, many of them, for many years, had very big majorities. I mean, it's not a new phenomenon, the switch in voters. And Scotland was there as an example. It was Canary in the coal mine, if you like, which was explained, at the, explained away even at the time as being to do with the rise in nationalism. It was, it was actually, it was a you know, as a Scot, my view on it always was that people felt that the Labour Party was assuming that they'd vote for them. Is, could that same be said in some of the seats that they lost in 2019? Well, I would say that every campaigner, every activist, every union member in this room would never take any vote for granted. And certainly in Batley and Spen, when we won just over 300 plus votes, as you know, I, there is not one vote that is taken for granted in circumstances like that. I think there's something about identity here, though, isn't there? And I think devolution is an exciting opportunity. So you hear Mark Drakeford talk about well, uh, Wales and that if you're Welsh, you vote Labour. And that's where I want to get, that if you're from Yorkshire, you vote Labour, of course you do. Why would you vote anything else? Because actually, Labour in power is delivering for you and your communities. You see Labour in a positive way, um, you know, changing lives for the better, whether that's good housing or buses that run on time where you want at the right price, trains that work, and, and a relationship with the leadership that is open and transparent. Um, and Anasawa, I don't know if anybody saw him just now on the, on the conference platform, he was saying, let's talk about devolution for Glasgow. 
Glasgow City Region, why can't we have a mayor for you know different areas of Scotland? It's quite an exciting opportunity, I think. Devolution is probably our, our opportunity to really have this deep dive. But when it comes to patriotism, having spent a year as a member of parliament on the armed forces parliamentary scheme, I have never been more proud of our armed forces. And certainly that's something that Batley and Spen, when I was the MP, they really did um, like, and it gave them a sense of identity and belonging. But fundamentally, we're also Yorkshire. And I think we have this chance to have those regional um, uh, loves as well as national uh, across the country. So I think it is a great opportunity. And Gordon Brown is doing um, a bit of work on this about devolution, what it means, our identity and so on. Um, uh, Keir's asked him to do that report. So it'd be very, very interesting to hear what uh, comes out of that report. And Andrew, we're here mostly to talk about winning back the red wall, but is the so-called blue wall part of that? I mean, we saw with Chesham and Amersham, for example, the sort of early signs that the Tories might be vulnerable in some of their southern seats to Lib Dem voters. Is that, is that a phenomenon that could actually make a difference when it comes to the next election, or are we, are we looking years, years ahead? No, I think that is a vulnerability for the Tories. We shouldn't lose from... We talk about the red wall the whole time. The majority of the Tory seats are in the south. Mm and they have to keep those seats. And they do face a problem because many of the MPs in those southern seats look at the prospect of radical economic change with horror. Uh, it's, and they've been protected from that by COVID. I mean, if, you know, it's impossible to exaggerate the degree to which we've been politics free during the pandemic because it's dominated everything else. But as we come out into a tighter, sort of fis tighter fiscal environment, as we reach the end of furlough, they're going to have to make choices that can't be fudged. And yeah, that is a weakness for the Conservative Party. And it's one, you know, the Lib Dems are looking to exploit in some of those southern seats like Cheshire and Amersham. So it's definitely there. Just can I say something very, very quickly on taking voters for granted? I think there was a lot of that. I think, you know, it's almost automatic, isn't it, in, under our system? If there are areas where you weigh the vote, uh, you sort of assume you're going to win it and you plough your resources into seats that look marginal. And I don't think that was helped by the rather absurd electoral strategy that the leadership came up with for 2019, which was going on the offensive and not looking at these seats. Or if you look across those seats that Labour lost, the signs weren't just there in Scotland. The signs were there in 2017. Uh, you know, Theresa May came very, very close to winning a lot of those seats then, but those lessons weren't learned. So I think that was a function of the electoral strategy of the last leadership in 2019 as much as anything else. Um, I'm going to ask the panel another, another set of questions each, but then come to you, um, because I think it's more fun to open up the discussion. Um, so if you could start having a think about what you, what you might like to ask, um, so you've got some questions ready. Um, I was slightly late, I, I was slightly late um, arriving here because as you probably already know, Andy MacDonald quit the Shadow Cabinet um, in a row for the minimum wage. Um, pay is clearly a, key, a, a massive issue, not just for people in the sort of seats we're talking about, but across the country. How can Labour capitalise, well, first of all, I should rephrase that, what can Labour do to make sure that people are in better paid, more secure jobs? And how can it capitalise from the fact that the Conservatives aren't doing that? So I think this is um, a really important um, issue and I think one of the um, most important things in Rachel's speech um, earlier today was when she talked about the everyday economy um, we heard um, we've seen echoes of this in the things that Keir's been talking about in the things that Angela's been talking about as well and in the um, the fact that the Covid crisis has really shone a spotlight on the fact that there are people in jobs right across the country that have been undervalued and underpaid for far too long. And that if you're thinking about that local economy, I think many of the people doing a lot of those jobs actually did not vote Conservative in 2019. But actually they are not getting a fair deal from the Conservatives in any way. And Labour needs to be championing people in those incredibly important jobs right across our economy, people who kept working through the COVID crisis, who were more likely to be on the front line in the COVID crisis. There was some research that looked at some of those um, 
uh, seen as red wall constituencies and actually at the number of people who were still going out to work during the COVID crisis because were more likely to be in the jobs that had to keep being done, whether that was the, the care workers, the, the factory workers, the distribution workers, uh, the people who were cleaning the handles on the door of the ICU unit who were doing just as important a job in the middle of a public health crisis as the doctors and nurses working in the NHS as well. And too many of those jobs, and I'd say this particularly about care working jobs, I think have been undervalued for a very long time. And too often probably in, um, in the past when labour was too often seen as just being about the graduates in the cities, when actually that's not who we are and that's not where we started. And we've always been the party for working people and we have to shout louder about that. And that's exactly the things I think that our shadow cabinet have been doing. And I'd say I think there's some lessons you can learn from the way that other countries have been doing that. If you look at um, what Norway, the Norway Labour Party that has just come first in the September election, looking to lead a government hopefully for the first time since 2013, their slogan was, it probably doesn't quite, it quite translate, and I confess to not knowing any Norwegian, but the slogan was, it's the ordinary people's turn now. And then Germany, where we've seen the SPD um, this weekend with a significant comeback after many years of decline, the theme of their campaign was around respect and respect for work and respect for the kinds of jobs people do, whatever the jobs people do, and respect for the dignity of work as well. So I think those are strong Labour themes. They've also, they've always traditionally been part of the Labour tradition, part of the, the Labour the Labour movement and the kinds of things we've called for and campaigned for, but I think they need to be at the heart of the things that we are uh, campaigning on and championing now. And Tracy, public services, I mean, obviously Labour has always regarded itself, well, it is the, the party of the NHS, and that's a mantle that we've heard Boris Johnson quite a lot recently try and adopt for the Conservative Party, not least in the last couple of weeks with the plans, the money that they're putting into clearing the NHS backlog. How can you, how can Labour make sure that you retain your position as the party of the public services, the so schools as well, obviously, not just not just the NHS? Well, uh, what's really exciting about um, being a Metro Mayor is being able to put into place programs like the Fair Work Charter, where um, uh, we will be working more closely with companies that sign up to the Fair Work Charter. And that a Fair Work Charter means that the people you employ are paid a real living wage, that there is opportunity for union recognition, opportunity for personal growth in that company. And working with um, other mayors across the region, we can also make this a northern pledge. Um, and, you know, I, I, I represent 2.3 million, Andy Burnham, 2.8 million. Think of the millions of workers that we are hopefully transforming their lives and their futures by saying, if you want, procure, if you want us to procure some services from you, then we'd love it if you want to sign up to this Fair Work Charter. Because uh, I, I know... You know, personally, my sister is a um, domiciliary care worker and she does the 15-minute slots. She is paid pennies for what she does. She should and must be paid more. Now, we know that um, we've had a crisis in the NHS and in social care. I'm deeply frustrated that the spin on this levy, when it lands on people's bills, that it's going to be an NHS and social care levy because then it will... Then the public will say... Oh, we've done our bit now. Why is social care falling over still? We've actually uh, contributed. We know that this is a scam. We know that this is smoke and mirrors. And we should be making the case really loudly that this money will go to the NHS, and that is great to see, and long time coming. But it will not solve this social care crisis. And that's what we need to put in place, that the people who deliver the care for our most vulnerable, our older citizens. I mean, my sister had a double... She was supposed to be there for 15 minutes but she was there for nearly 35 because the person she was supposed to be looking after had dementia was locked in for their own safety but they'd been hiding 
and they were hiding in the wardrobe and she couldn't find them. But then she's late for her next, uh, her next call and that time she doesn't get paid for. So we know that they are on the front line and we also, I can see where NHS and the union movement are going to say, look, this isn't good enough. 3% isn't good enough. It's no use clapping us on a Thursday and then giving us no money on a Friday. So I think potentially we are in for a bit of conflict here, but the Fair Work Charter working across the regions, setting that gold-plated standard, I think is a way that we can say this is what Labour would do in, in power in government. Um, so Yvette has talked a bit about jobs and work, and you've talked a bit about public services. The other thing, the other area which the, the Labour leadership has been talking a lot about is security, and I use that term not as national security, but both security at home, so you know your communities <coughs> with crime and antisocial behaviour, but mm -hmm. also... Um, how you, you know, more, more broadly, um, I guess, sort of, you know, the more traditional security defence issues and so on. And how, how do you, how crucial is security um, in those terms, do you think, to, to sort of Labour's answer to some of these questions? And immigration as well, that's another, I suppose, area which would fall under this. Yeah, I mean, I thought that Starmer in his, I mean, it's a, it's a bloody long to be an essay, his short book. Uh, <laughs> was rather convincing on security and I thought the story that he had to tell on security was a good one and that's the story that goes right from security as national security to security as economic security mm -hmm. to security as having safer spaces in your communities like parks or whatever. I think that message will resonate and it's one that it's good politics for Labour to stress because it helps them on that sort of values divide a little bit and there are signs that Labour is trusted on that so I th it makes absolute sense for me for Labour to be hammering away on that. On immigration, uh, it, it's worth noting first and foremost that public perceptions of immigration have shifted quite radically since the referendum of 2016. So actually, I think we're in a place now where we can probably have a more honest and open discussion about immigration uh, than we have managed since you know the early 2000s when we were getting asylum seekers and refugees and immigrants confused. If, uh, and, and that would be a good thing to do. But, we, you know, the simple fact of the matter is the kind of immigration policy we now have in place will always cause more economic problems than the sort of decentralised system that was freedom of movement. Uh, if freedom of movement allowed the market to take care of the number of people we had coming into this country, there is no way under what, a government of whatever hue that a government can choose the right numbers of people coming in. Now, I'm not saying, therefore, we should have free movement again. I think we should be honest, though, about the trade-off. And the trade-off is there will be a certain amount of economic disruption the moment the government starts being in charge of the numbers and sorts of people who are letting into the country. Okay. Um, right, I'm keen to come to you for questions now. What I'm going to... What I'm going to do is take three questions at a time. Please tell me who you are. If you could stand up and shout if you're at the back. Your question, if it's a speech, I'm going to, be, I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to be really strict, OK? If you just want questions, we want them short. And then, I, then we'll direct them at the panel. So he's promised to be short, so on you go. You go first, if you don't mind. Um, Can you tell Mark me your name? Mark Drayford. Mark Drayford. What does the panel think about the Mark Drayford effect for, for England, basically? OK, that's a great one. Thank you. And here? I'm Ashley Dalton. Um, I'm currently in Essex, but I'm from Lancashire. Um, and what I want to ask you about is, what do we need to do to understand how people in those seats we lost in 2019 actually see the Tories? Because we talk a lot about, oh, how could they vote for the Tories? Aren't they all terrible? But the truth is that people have seen and looked at the Conservative Party and seen something that they wanted yep. and they felt they could vote for. So how do we, as the Labour Party, look at that and learn from it and start to actually reflect what those people are looking for again? Good question, thank you. And the gentleman here. Yeah, you please. Um, thank you, uh, good evening. Um, I'm uh, Peter Cooks in Manchester. Gorton CLP, so um, just uh, over the um, hills from West Yorkshire. And in our area, we lost 10 seats as well, so um, j j just a couple of very, very quick things. Firstly, I've, I've been campaigning for a long time, and I've always had the same view, which is you can't just ask for votes and hope they'll all pile up. You have to make people vote for you. You have to put yourself in a position where Labour's not only the obvious choice, but is the only choice because of the way you campaigned. And my second point is... 
those people that voted Conservative and, and ended up with a Conservative MP in a traditionally held Labour seat. Do you think they uh, did not intend that and it was just a protest or that they simply didn't care okay. what the result in their seat was going to be? Thank you. Those are great questions. Um, I'll just go through each of the panel and you can answer the ones that you feel you mm -hmm. want to address. If you keep your answers fairly succinct, then we get around to more questions because there were lots. But so, Yvette, let's start with you. Um, I think um, they, I think, well, I think uh, look, people have all sorts of different reasons for voting. So that we should be very clear about that. So there's lots and lots of different um, perspectives and lots of different perspectives of the Tories, which is a really interesting thing, but I do think this idea of the Tories managing to capture optimism, or particularly Boris Johnson managed to, managing to capture optimism and change was really important. Of course, also, look, you know, the, I mean, the points that I made before about um, uh, people felt, uh, for a lot of people felt, that, um, that Labour wasn't respecting their vote and that was on Brexit. And that respect issue is also a really important thing. And, um, and therefore, um, for people who were voting just literally to get Brexit done because that was their vote being respected, that was really important. And also feeling that um, the Tories would offer them um, more sense of security for the country. I think, interestingly, to go to the Mark Drayford point, that some of those things really unravel now when you see actually just chaotic, uh, shambolic government from the Tories compared to what Mark has been doing, which is just really steady, just getting on with things, delivering, actually working in practice. And, um, and it's why I think, you know, Keir's sort of steady, you know, serious approach is really important because that is about actually the practical things that, that you need to get done. Yeah, I think the, the, the Conservatives are seen as sort of law and order, that you will have a better life, you and your family will have a better life, opportunity, ambition. But I think potentially this is an opportunity for us because this is all unravelling. The chaos that we've seen when Priti Patel is focused on, on refugees in dinghies, when we've got, you know, queues outside petrol stations key workers can't get to their job because they can't get petrol. Cost of living is going through the roof. This is a unique opportunity. But if I could also just pick up on the safety and security question, because that's how the Conservatives have been seen, that you will be safer in your communities under a Conservative government. Well, I disagree that I think this is a moment when potentially women and girls in society are feeling the least safe they've ever felt. And I would say as the first ever woman Metro Mayor, one of my finest decisions I ever made, I think, was asking Alison Lowe to be my Deputy Mayor and uh, lead on police and crime. And as a woman of colour, and both of us as survivors of sexual violence, we can lead with authenticity to say we are, we're sick of it and we're going to make a difference. And Labour in power is going to make our communities safer because we're going to put money on early intervention and supporting uh, support for victims. And I committed to 750 more police officers and staff. We need to say to our communities, this is Labour in power, understanding you and your family don't feel safe where you live and where you work and where you go to college. So I think this is a unique opportunity that we can't let slip because they have always been seen as the party of law and order, we definitely can take up that, we can park our tanks on their lawn in that subject. Um, Anna, can you pick up on some of the issues that weren't addressed by the others? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things on Drakeford and one thing on the Tories. On Drakeford, limited lessons for the National Party because part of the Drakeford effect, I think, through lockdown was the fact that no one had heard of him before. COVID and his profile rose very, very suddenly. What I do think, though, is that what Drakeford and Tracy and Andy Burnham show is Labour need to mobilise these strong regional figures in any future electoral campaign. Uh, and they need to be front and centre of any such campaign because they have developed real profile and they're popular in their regions and they are key electoral assets. On the Tories, just a couple of quick points. One, I think Labour have tended to underestimate Boris Johnson 
Whatever you think about Boris Johnson, he's pretty damn skilled at being a politician and at winning elections. And I think that's something that needs to be taken seriously. And secondly, I think histori at the moment there is a danger of just not taking con conservatism and conservative voters seriously enough. I think, and this comes back to that whole debate about the language we use. Sometimes I think this party forgets that ultimately it needs to get to Tory voters to vote Labour. And that requires them to understand them and to persuade them. And sometimes I suspect that simply just sort of slagging them off seems easier, but is far less effective as an electoral strategy. Good point. Um, right, I'll take another, another, sorry. Yeah, Tracy has to dash off. Apologies. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Tracy. Real um, to we'll take another round of questions from, from Abed and Anand. Um, so I'm kind of working backwards here, but yes, you've got your arm up with the check shirts. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to give you 20 seconds to ask your question and then I'm going to cut you off. Right. Go. Um, Yvette said earlier on that 70% of the cities are born for us. I think that's because a hell of a lot of our young people are leaving towns and going to cities. They're not coming back because they don't have the jobs. There's not the culture, there's not the other things that make life worth living in the towns anymore. And how do you think we address that? Thank you. That was very succinct. Um, <laughs> and and uh, just next to you, there with the mask on. Thanks. Hello. Um, my name is Christopher and I'm from North Somerset. Um, I go to university in County Durham um, and I'd like to ask the uh, panel how, how, whether they think that the 2019 wasn't the low point and in County Durham this year we lost, uh, lost control of the um, County Council for the first time in the century, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and th there's one at the back standing. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, that's all right. Thanks. Also from County Durham. And, What's your uh, name? Uh, Sam Rushworth. I um, wanted to ask about port barrel politics and the issue that we have that people in, in the North East don't know that 7,000 civil service jobs have been cut, but they do know that 700 Treasury jobs are coming. And, and the Tories' approach to politics and the fact that Labour won't make retail offers to specific seats. Okay, there's great questions. Yvette, do you want to um, kick off? So, um, uh, I think um, just starting with the middle one um, in terms of um, where the low point is, we have to be building back. We have to be rebuilding in, um, in our towns and communities where we've lost votes. Um, Tracy's gone now, but I think for us in West Yorkshire, actually it was um, a turning point having, the, uh, having Tracy's election. Actually, we did better in Tracy's election than we had done in the 2019 general election. So we felt that actually having that optimistic vision through the mayoral campaign actually was a turning point for us and was a way of starting to rebuild, starting to get more support. I think interestingly that probably some of this does um, actually draw on is actually what those local arguments and issues are because of the way that what the Tories have done is try to, as I was saying at the beginning, blame Labour councils for or a lot of the damage that the actually the Tory government nationally has done over many years. It means that countering that can often become a very local one, a very regional one, and, and involved in that sort of hand-to-hand -hand, um, combat almost on what those regional things are, and does also mean exposing some of the um, uh, sort of pork barrel politics, I think, in your question um, about um, the way in which they can make a, a kind of a single announcement about something happening for, uh, for a town or for a constituency that actually doesn't even reverse the scale of the cuts that we've had and the scale of the damage that's been done, the scale of the jobs that were taken away over the last 10 years, nor does it actually offer a long-term sustainable uh, future and a way of having more new jobs be homegrown in a lot of our towns and communities, which I think takes the Matthews point about um, young people leaving uh, towns because actually the opportunities aren't there. 
And I think this is actually one of the biggest things for the country. This is like, obviously, it's a big challenge for Labour, but essentially, this is a big issue for the whole country because um, we, I think, saw this divide grow between cities and towns that is not just about the politics of the 2019 election. It actually reflects, you can see it in going right back over, over maybe a decade, that divide between cities and towns that is really important and potentially becomes really damaging for the country because actually it's the sort of, you know, as Joe Cox would say we have more in common than that which divides us but we've been allowing this economic or under the Tories we've seen that economic divide growing so jobs have been growing twice as fast in cities as in towns economic growth per head has been twice as fast in cities as in towns and when you've got that double whammy of private sector and public sector jobs and investment uh, leaving towns that means the young people chasing those opportunities will also be leaving towns so what do you have the answers I could go on for, uh, bang on for far too long about this but you know you have better connections the investment I've only got one train an hour from Normanton into Leeds that is shocking it's only 20 minutes away it's absolutely bonkers if we were 20 minutes away from the centre of London then we would have a train every five minutes there would be multiple trains of course we need a massive investment in connections but also in having a jobs plan that brings jobs back so we don't actually have everybody has to become a commuter into Leeds or into the neighbouring cities and so on there should be a jobs plan for every town the post-Covid learning from what happened during the pandemic and the use of new technology it actually should be an opportunity to bring jobs back into towns but you've got to be active when we had Yorkshire Forward when we had uh, proper regional development agencies actually they did some of this I mean, people might remember when everybody was talk of Barnsley being a hill town and learning from the Italian hill towns as part of its urban renaissance I mean there were all kinds of ideas circling around but actually that was partly about a Yorkshire Forward and a regional development agency backed by a Labour government that was supporting towns as well as cities and what we've seen in the last 10 years is actually that divide grow but because Labour councils were representing a lot of those towns then actually those Labour councils have ended up taking the flak for that divide but actually it's been a missing strategy from the government and from the regional support to actually start turning that around I think there's masses we could do but we actually have to do that and Labour needs to be the champion of that this is not just about single lump sums to do one-off capital projects it's about a proper vision about skills about jobs and about quality services being back in our towns as well I hope this doesn't get too dull now because I think we're going to agree on, on quite a lot. I mean, the one thing I'd say about towns and cities is, is, you know, be slightly cautious about the London example because London is so expensive that its growth spawns growth in the, town, growth in the towns around it. The danger you're going to get in some northern cities if you encourage growth there and simply, you know, if it was easier to get from Wakefield to London on the train, the danger is that you create a load of dormitory towns that don't have life in their own right. And I don't think that is something we should want. I think these, these places are communities that need to have economies that function in their own right. And so we, we just need to be careful that it's not simply making a region grow. It's making a region grow and making sure the engines of that growth are distributed within that region as well. Was 2019 a low point? Not necessarily. I mean, you know, Yvette can testify to the fact that the Brexit party and sucked up votes that could have gone to the Conservatives otherwise. I mean, 2019 could have been far, far worse than it was. So we shouldn't... I, mean, I don't think anyone in this room is complacent at the moment when facing an 80-seat Tory majority, but no, it could have been worse, and I suppose we should be aware of that. And on retail offer, actually, the, the point I want to make here is I think Labour have a bit of a unique opportunity. And Labour is the party of fairness, we know that, but I think Labour now has space to become the party of prosperity because the Conservatives quite palpably aren't. You know, we're talking about a governing party that blames businesses for shortages. We're talking about a governing party that deliberately signed a trade deal that would make doing business harder. If ever there was an opportunity for Labour to position itself, not just as the party for a fairer Britain, but the party for a more prosperous Britain. So we're going to divide the pie more fairly, but you know what? The pie is going to be bigger under us because we're going to listen to people and figure out how to make the economy work. So I think actually in terms of retail politics, there's a national opportunity for the Labour Party now, simply because this government seems so incapable of managing an economy effectively. Hey, there was some more hands up. Any more questions? Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, the mics at the back, so we'll start at the back. Uh, yes, right in front of you. And, and, and there's two more hands here as well. But if you could go to them next, that'd be great. Hello. I stand Hi. Up. I'm quite small. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Jess. I'm from Lee. Hi, Jess. Um, so we lost our MP, Joe Platt, in 2019. 
Um, I think one of the things that was reflected heavily was from the Labour Party, it was a we know best attitude. We were told that there's not a chance that we were going to lose. Um, and Lisa Avon and Joe all had to defy whip on the Brexit vote just to stand up for the Brexiteers. Um, don't shoot the messenger, I'm not one. But they had to do that because PLP didn't really care. And it, I think we talk quite a lot about what we need to do, but not how. We've got a membership less than 600. We've got people going, same as Hartlepool. We've got no education, we've got no prospects. There's no pride in the town. So as much as we're being a bit wishy-washy of what we need to do, until we actually get down to the how, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. OK, thank you. So on to the how. Um, uh, sorry, can you remind me of who else? Yes, there. Yeah. Uh, Birgit Miller from Hove CLP. Sorry, what was your name, sorry? Birgit Miller. Birgit. Yeah. Um, I wonder if um, what, what certainly the, um, the delegate from the, the member from Durham mentioned, um, that the red wall seats are now sharing a equality with the blue wall which is surrounds where I live and that is a disproportionate amount of retired people and how do we win those voters I think that is really important I can't see any way of winning the blue wall if we cannot get over get, get the pensioners to vote for us okay thank you and then there was a man here yeah you could come forward with the mic triple lock or you, or you can just shout whatever so what's your name sorry Jonathan Yeah, and earlier in the day, it was um, Angela Rayner's comments, of course. Um, OK, Anna, let's start with you this time. I mean, in a sense, Jonathan and Jess's question, I'll bundle them both up, because I think Labour needs to show itself to be the party that cares about the issues that voters care about. And I think that goes back to what Yvette was saying earlier. You need to ruthlessly have a message. And at the moment, if you can't figure out what that message is, then you shouldn't be in politics. I mean, you know... Uh, it's the cost of living, and it's the cost of living because of this government. So I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, you know, judge the conference after Wednesday when everything's finished. I think, you know, people rushing to judge what this conference was like on a Sunday evening when, you know, most of the main speeches haven't been made is probably premature. But absolutely, for the rest of this conference, I, I agree absolutely. Talk about the things the voters care about if you want them to give you the time of day uh, and to give, you know, places like where Jess lives, give, give them a chance to elect a Labour MP. Uh, on old voters, I think, I think economic competence is very, very important indeed. I think having something sensible to say about, say about social care will help. But again, I think you know, the, the particular, there is a particular and unique vulnerability about this government when it comes to economic competence at the moment. Uh, recent polling has shown that more people think that the government is not capable of managing inflation than is, and that's has shifted over the last four to five months. I think Labour needs to be setting itself up as the party you can trust to manage the national economy because they will never get a better opportunity than this. And I think that will help attract that demographic. Um, yes, I think starting with um, Jess's thing, I mean, I think, look, it was the points I made at the beginning about um, the problems for us in 2019 and... I think um, Labour just being seen as disrespectful of the way that people had voted in the Brexit referendum. That was the problem with the se second referendum pledge, that it just looked disrespectful. It was just looked mm. that you're not taking people's votes seriously. And, um, and that just echoes that interesting um, slow the fact that the SPD and Germany have made respect an important part of their, their slogan, respecting people, whoever they are, and their different um, circumstances, the work that they do, and so on, just being something that is really important for rebuilding um, trust with um, some of the voters that, that we lost. I think as far as the um, 
uh, the uh, the older voters and um, retired voters that we need to rebuild um, support along. The, the shift, I think the shift between 2017 and 2019 was quite a big one in terms of the older voters as well. I can't remember the precise figures now, but I think that was quite a big um, shift. And I think um, issues, I mean, the things that come up for us, you know, chatting to people on the doorstep, talking to people in the town centres, it's very often around um, crime and antisocial behaviour in communities, so that sense of local community security. People also actually have real talk very often about um, the NHS and actually NHS being part of that security for, um, for older people as well. GP appointments comes up time and again now. And in fact, actually, I suppose um, in terms of what are the things that Labour should be talking about, if we're really to be talking about the things that matter across the country, for my constituency, I'd say the um, it, crime actually does come up, crime and social behaviour uh, comes up for, for some people when we're talking some areas. But I would say the three things that come up the most would be the cost of living crisis, uh, the GP appointments and town pride. Those, I think, would be the th three things. And town pride in involves a lot of different things as part of that. It's about jobs, it's about pride in our history, it's about the future. But I just do keep coming back to, I think, the cost of living crisis, the Tory cost of living crisis, that is the thing we should be talking about most because it is going to be massive for people. It is going to be absolutely devastating for huge numbers of families right across the country. I do not know how many families across, not just across my constituency, but right across the country, are going to be managing this Christmas. I do not know how they're going to manage, given the amount of money that they are going to be hit by, not just from universal credit, but now with the bills going up as well. That is what Labour needs to be focusing on. To be honest, if we could make enough fuss about that, if we could make build up enough of a campaign and be arguing about that, there is, I think, still a chance that we could force Rishi Sunak to reverse some of the universal credit cut in the October budget. That should be what we're aiming to do. That should be what we should do in terms of standing up for people, but that means every single one of us uh, making shouting about the damage that the Tories' cost of living crisis is doing time and time again whenever we get the chance, whenever we can, wherever we can, keep shouting about it because we have got to put the pressure on. That is Labour standing up for our communities. It looks like MPs might get another chance to vote on UC. Philippa Stride, the Tory peer who was one of the architects of UC, said that she's going to try and force a vote to the Lords so that it then comes back to the Commons. So there may well be an opportunity there. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. So there are a couple of quick questions. Very happy to take them and then we'll, then we'll wrap up. Um, there were still there were some hands. Are you still wanting to do a question? Well, there's also a couple at the back. Well, do, we'll do... OK. So sorry, who were the hands? There was one hand here and there was somebody over on this side. Yeah, down the front here? Yep. So, yeah, we'll come to you after. Um, hello, so I'm from County Durham as well, and one of the big problems we have... So, what's your name, sorry? Oh, sorry, Sam. Sam, Sam Carling, I like, it. I like knowing everyone's CLB. names. <laughs> um, and one of the big problems we have is social conservatism, in that we have a lot of people who really don't like immigration, which is one of the reasons the Brexit vote was so high, and continue to sort of really bang on about issues like the crossings down at Dover. And also, we have a lot of just general opposition to what the right-wing media would call wokeness and we would probably call human decency in most cases. <laughs> and sort of, how do we combat that? How do we make that not the focus and how do we change the narrative on those kinds of issues? Good question, thanks. And then there was one, it was um, down the front, third row back, please. Sorry, third row from the front. Yeah. Here, yeah. Thanks, yeah, here, yeah. Um, so, so my question, um, Louise, sorry, Please. my name. Um, my question touches on the economic competence point and related to that, the way Labour talks about its records of being in government. Obviously, you don't want to like go on about the past all the time, but it seems that the left of the party is always saying, you know, we're just as bad as the Tories or the terrible things we did, and the right is always saying, like conceding a lot of the points and saying, yeah, we did spend too much. Blah, blah, blah. I work in healthcare and I see the impact of a Labour government and investment and so on. Is there like I? You know, think Gordon Brown was a very effective chancellor, and you know, is there a way to argue that point without dragging up the past again, or do we just are we just conceding that now? Are we just letting that go? That's my question. Okay, Anand. 
on on the second question, yes, there is. And I think I think actually Keir Starmer did it in that essay. I mean, he made a start that actually you you sort of start to take a pride in what Labour did and what Labour did well. And there was an awful lot that Labour did and that Labour did well. And I think absolutely the party needs to take pride in that. And that's part of the narrative about selling the party as the party of economic competence. Sam, on values issues, what, what I would say on values is... I don't think it's the terrain on which the party wants to be fighting a general election. And the simple reason for that is the Conservative Party is essentially a values coalition now. Uh, but it is all over the place on economic policy. So, you know, the Tories can probably agree on statues, but if you ask them about income tax, they'll have a massive fight. And the opposite is probably true about the Labour Party. Uh, so I think just for pure tactical reasons, if you want to choose your battleground for the next, e the next election, I would choose the economy over values. And that's why I said, you know, what happens to the economy over the next six to 12 months is going to be absolutely fundamental to the political future. Uh, if we have a rocky and pr slower than expected recovery from the lockdown and the pandemic, I think Labour have a real opportunity there uh, to shift the terrain of politics back. And actually, at that point, this very, very sort of cumbersome Tory coalition starts to show its cracks even more cl clearly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so starting with the, uh, the last Labour government, and um, yeah, I think we have just got to be proud of the achievements of the last Labour government and talk them up and remind people what they were. Because, you know, if... Um, if we're not proud of the last Labour government, how are we going to persuade people to vote for another one in future? And we did do a huge number of things that just completely transformed people's lives. And, you know, we've got, um, I've got a local councillor who's a brilliant local Labour councillor who will tell you now her life was transformed by Sure Start and the difference that that made and for her family and being able to take um, the kids to, to Sure Start. And so the difference that those things made are huge and we should uh, talk about them. And also on the economy, I mean, you know, we invested and we had, you know, debt fell under the Labour government before we got to the financial crisis. And then rightly, Gordon Brown made sure that we didn't end up with a complete crisis where people couldn't get their cash out of the hole in the wall, which is what we could otherwise have faced as a result of what was effectively a private sector banking crisis where the government had to pick up the pieces. Um, oh, and then Sam's finished upon Sam's point about social conservatism. I think... Um, Look, clearly there is a problem on some of these debates that just end up with people just getting completely polarised and shouting at each other and, uh, and things becoming really divided and talking past each other. Actually, on a lot of things, though, I think there is more consensus than we sometimes recognise. And I think Sunder was here, uh, Sunder Katwala was here um, earlier. We did some work when, um, uh, with British Future on the um, uh, Home Affairs Select Committee on how you can build a consensus on immigration, for example, and that actually when you get people talking to each other from very different points of view, often when they start, actually there is more consensus than you'd think on what are the kinds of things that build a fair immigration system for the future. So I think and there are some areas where I don't think we should recoil from things. I think you can try and build consensus and not just allow issues um, to be polarised. What I'd also say is I think there is a progressive communitarian tradition within the Labour movement that sometimes, and certainly some of the last couple of years, has ended up being drowned out, which is about the, the focus on, on community, not just on rights. And that's been a really important tradition. It's part of a tradition that is not conservative. It's actually there can be a progressive but pro-community focus um, as part of it you know you think about sometimes the Christian socialist tradition um, in the labor movement and, and so on so um, and I think that what Keir has been doing is trying to sort of broaden out to include the sort of liberal and communitarian traditions in the Labour Party and bring them together and not just go down just specifically a kind of liberal Labour um, approach which is I think actually is where we had started to get channeled um, between sort of after 2015, we had got very much channeled down a much more liberal Labour um, approach rather than reflecting both the broad liberal and communitarian um, traditions. Thank you. Well, Yvette Coupon and, and 
sorry, Yvette Cooper and Anand Menon, <laughs> don't get that out, um, and Tracy Braben in her, in her absence. Thank you, thank you for a um, really thought-provoking panel, I'm sure that, and, and thank you for your great questions. I'm sure this is something that we're all going to be talking about in the bars later and in the days and weeks ahead, and let's see where it gets the Labour Party. So thanks very much. <laughs>